Yeah, find some. There's, there's Sammy. Hello, Jess. Jess, you want to? Good morning, everyone. Okay. I sort of feel like I'm down as low as I can get, which is probably good. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's great to have you guys all here, ladies and gents, with us. Uh, today, we're really lucky and privileged to have Dr. Trapper Fish with us. Now, Traff, I remember way back in the day when I first started at Avenal, and Traff actually looked after student services. And uh, we had some of the best times back in college with, uh, probably from your department, a lot of the socials and our assemblies and chapels. Uh, it was just a wonderful time. Uh, Dr. Trapp is actually up on holidays very quickly. And uh, when I rang him, I said, mate, it's, it's a bit terrible, isn't it, to ask someone on the holidays to come and present. But uh, Dr. Trapp Fisher, if we would like you to come up, we'll just get to know you just quickly and uh, we'll let you jump straight into your presentation. Traf, tell us about your family. I know that you've got a wife and, and a few others. <laughs> a few others, yeah. I'm married to my good wife. Yeah, how's your good? Uh, hi, everybody. Nice to be with you. Um, Carol is my wife, and uh, she is an English as a second language teacher, and we met at Avondale, like a lot of other couples did, uh, back in the 70s, and we have uh, two adult children, if that makes sense. Uh, our son and daughter-in-law and two little kids are up in Budrum. We're going to catch them tomorrow. And uh, our daughter and son-in-law and three girls uh, live in Maryland, which is in the USA. And our son-in-law cares for uh, his vice president for ADRA International for people and culture. And our daughter works at ADRA as well. Yes, we're trying to get Corey home. It'd be lovely yes, to it'd see be nice, him here, that's it? for sure. Well, Trap, uh, today we're looking forward to your presentation. Just so everyone's aware, uh, Trap will present for an hour. And at the end of that time, we've got a Q&A time. If we don't have heaps of questions, that's okay. Uh, but you also have the opportunity to come and talk to Traff and maybe ask a couple of quick questions. And then you need to head up to Butterham on holidays. Well, no, we're, we're at Peachester oh, with Peachester. my wife's mum. Yeah, it's kind of a little holiday time because my, my, my brother and his uh, partner live in Tweed Heads and my mum at a retirement village in Narang, my wife's mum at Peachester and our son in Budrum. So within two hours, we do the family bash and it's kind oh, of cool. Beautiful. Well, I have to, I have to uh, say, Traff, I love your mum. She is really. uh, When I go to church at Gold Coast, that was my old church. Yeah. And she's one of the first ladies I look out to give a hug. She's such a fragile little thing. I don't want yeah. to squash her. Go but, carefully. Uh, but uh, she's a beautiful woman. Traff, yeah. let me pray with you and thank we'll you. let you go for it. Lord, uh, we thank you so much. Uh, for Traff, for his life and for the way that you've led him. We also thank you for a lot of uh, maybe uh, people here today who are parents, maybe not parents even yet, but uh, we're very interested to know um, any little insights on how we can do this better. Lord, be with this presentation. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Traff. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to all. I'm just going to grab a little stand here to put a couple of notes on and uh, we'll join you back down. Lovely to be with you. Um, I was reminiscing with Sean um, 15 years ago. We finished here in uh, 25 plus. Pastor Chris Foot and I cared for this tent for seven years. And uh, so this is kind of memory lane. Thank you so much. All these people helping, it's marvelous. Thank you, Dave. And um, so it's kind of neat to come back. We were uh, associate pastor at Springwood Church for uh, four years or so. And then I was a chaplain here at the school for three years. Uh, as part of our stay in uh, Queensland, so we had a blast. Um, my ministry has mainly been in youth ministry and, and family. Uh, I kicked off in Warburton, for those who know way down in Melbourne, as youth pastor there for a couple of years, then came up to Sydney, was in youth work in there for eight years. Uh, went up to Cairns for a couple of years, Adelaide for a couple of years, and then I was on the staff, as you said, Sean, for 10 years. Uh, back up here for eight years, and then the division office in family ministries for 12. So it's been a fun career. And uh, I'm enjoying retirement. Uh, I, 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 we had lunch with a, another retired couple on Sabbath, and he said, retirement is that period in life 
where you do a few odd jobs between medical appointments. <laughs> oh man, uh, old age is a little overrated. Uh, stay young. Uh, no, look, we're having a ball. Um, I enjoy do some lecturing at Avondale College, Avondale University, um, each semester teaching third year education students and also this year did a, a subject for theology students. So we're having a ball and uh, we love uh, being with you this morning. Uh, Sean gave me the title of Parenting with Faith. I think we've got a... We've, um, is, are we show that first screen up? Uh, is that cool? Uh, yeah, Parenting with Faith. Uh, I put in Big Camp. Forgive me, but a few of us used to call it Big Cramp. Uh, <coughs> big Camp, South Queensland. Parenting with Faith. There's two ways of viewing this. Of, of, of parenting with faith. There's, I'm parenting with faith. I'm confident. And it's in the bag. I've just got the benediction. It's all done. Yeah, we're just pressing on with parenting with a whole lot of joy and courage. The other view would be, to, I'm parenting with faith. <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> Fear and trepidation. I don't know where you are, but I know where I was. Um, parenting, it's, it's pretty wild stuff. In fact, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you if, you, if I can. I know this is do the hand thing. All you went to primary school? Primary school? Yep, plenty of hands. High school? TAFE or university? Cool. Marriage school? You went to marriage school? You just raised your hand because you were getting used to it, right? Parenting school? Think about that. We're lunatics. <laughs> we're crazy. Two key periods or aspects of life, marriage and parenting. We combine with some person for the rest of our lives till death do us part. No training, no education. <laughs> we just stroll in and say, yep, I'll, do you take this woman? Yep. Do you take this man? I suppose. Let's do it. Boom, gone. Down the aisle, off we go. And then we make little creatures the same as us. No education, no training. It's crazy. <laughs> I admire and, and all of you, if you're parenting at the moment, if you're married and parenting, you deserve a medal. You really do. We do these huge things without any training or very little training. Now, I've often thought if I was going to the doctor and he said, look, we need to do some minor surgery, that's cool, and he's about to uh, inject the needle to anaesthetise, uh, you know, something on my leg, arm, and I said, doc, just before you do, where did you do your training? Oh, I didn't. No, no, my cat was a bit sick, so I, uh, I just treated the cat and it come good, so I thought I'd take up medicine. <laughs> Lying back in the dentist chair. Just before you, you do that, dentist, where did you do your training? Oh, I didn't, I, I just thought I'd give this a shot. We dive into marriage and parenting, just give it a shot. And it's not always easy. It's not always easy, so congratulations to all of you. I... When I was a young bloke, I had all the answers on parenting, of course. Um, I'd be wandering through Coles or Target and see some parent with a child out of control, and I'd just look and say, I know what to do. I knew what to do. I could just give me five minutes of that kid, and I'd sort him out. Then I had my own. <laughs> then I had my own, and things changed. In fact, uh, you've heard of Dr. James Dobson. I used to have four theories on child rearing and no kids. Now I have four kids and no theories. <laughs> I know that I relate to that. And uh, this one by Harpo Marx, I was the same kind of father as I was a harpist, I played by ear. <laughs> we just do it by default, don't we? We just kind of struggle through. Of course, these days there is plenty of help for parenting. And I came across this statement, I was staggered. If you took all the books available today on parenting and divided them by the number of days in a year, you'd discover that there has been an average of 10 new parenting books produced every day of the year for each of the past 21 years. That's more than 75,000 different parenting books currently at your disposal. How many have you read? <laughs> That's some serious, isn't it? And you walk into any decent bookshop, parenting is just shelves of the stuff. So everybody's got some great ideas out there and we need to read them and consult with them. And I thought it'd be pretty arrogant of me this morning to suggest here that I've got all the answers. And I think combined wisdom here among our group, we put it together and see if we can come up with some things that might help us. Let's pool our corporate ignorance and see what we can do. Let me, let me ask you a question. What's the primary task of parenting? And feel free to share. What's the primary task of parenting? Keeping them alive. Keeping them alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Surviving. Huh? Okay. 
Okay, good. What's the? Lead them to Christ. Okay, good. What's the primary task of parenting? I enjoy. My wife and I had the privilege of going to South Africa some years ago. So sometimes on Friday nights, so I jump on YouTube and just type in Africa, and up comes all different little clips of, or you know, some of them hours long. And there was one recently showing the animals, and I, I'm, I'm just a bit of a sucker for animals of Africa. It showed these wildebeest. You know, there's just serious, just there's thousands of the things in in hordes and just travelling. And it showed the birth of this little wildebeest calf. And the commentator said he has, she has 15 minutes to get this calf on its feet and running so they can stay with the, with the mob and, and keep away from lions and hyenas. And it showed this birth and this little calf sort of stumbling and falling and then gets up and stumbles and falls and gets up. And within 15 minutes it's jumping around and darting around and starts running with the herd. It's just phenomenal. You compare that to birth of a baby. This helpless, tiny little... Forgive me, lady, shriveled up prune. I'm fascinated, you know, when you go to a birthplace and you say, oh, look at isn't she, little darling? Hasn't she got a mother's ears? Oh, and look, that's a father's nose. And I'm thinking, she got anything of her own? <laughs> you know? And it's this little helpless thing. Can't do a cracker for itself. And we take this tiny little helpless thing and we journey beside this little he or she for however many years it takes to become independent and we wave goodbye so our primary task in my thing of parent is to take this little help totally helpless dependent little person and journey with them right through until we say you are now an independent adult person we don't know what age that will be we used to talk about the empty nest now in many homes it's the never empty nest and the tricky thing is for a, ch for a, 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 a male particularly <coughs> This part of the brain, the front part of your brain, is what we call the prefrontal cortex. It's the CEO of your brain. This is the part of the brain that's got all the, the job to do of right and wrong, truth and error, what's best, what's worst. Do you know what age it fully develops, mostly in guys? 20? 25? 30? Any advance on 30? 80? 90? <laughs> Some never develop, yeah. We want about kids doing the, you know, the 200 club where they're driving the cars at 200, they're doing all crazy stuff. This develops, fully develops about 25. Right. So sometimes we're asking kids to do stuff that their brain isn't there ready to do. So we need to cut them, keep, the level, keep the demands high but give them some slack. So you know, we've got this job of taking this little independent tiny person and journeying with them until they become, in my thinking, independent adults and we move from being on duty 24 7 until we're only on call as consultants and let's face it most probably as babysitters <laughs> i want you to consider the christian call to parenting i i just somehow believe we as christian parents have another layer of responsibility on us as parents that non-believers may not experience it's just a personal view there's a text in Jeremiah, and it's out of context, but we tend to hear it. Where is the beautiful flock that was entrusted to you? We have the sense that when it comes to the final times and we stand before God and he says, where's your kids? We feel that as parents. I'm sure we do. We have this extra layer, I think, of responsibility that's incredibly significant for us as Christian parents. We asked, what's one of the tasks for parents? And thank you, one of you said, lead them to Jesus. Right there, there it is. We have this sense, you know, we, a, a mum can say to her daughter, honey, don't wear that dress, you're going to get cold. The Christian parent might say, honey, don't wear that dress because, like, you know, it might lead you astray. Everything we do as Christian parents seems to have this kind of eternal life aspect about it. Where is thy flock? And I think it can be incredibly significant for us as Christians this text in um, everyone who heard this is John the Baptist when he was born everyone who heard this wondered about asking what, what then is this child going to be what then is this child going to be who's this special child and I think as parents you know I certainly felt it I was a pastor and I had children and that sense of eternal life responsibility was huge 
And I think we as parents, I really do, I think we as parents have this eternal life aspect of our parenting. We know that everything we do and say has an impact for good or not so good, and we feel that heavy responsibility. We know the sense of guilt and failure that we feel when we, our kids walk away, that, that walk away from the church. We struggle with that. How do, how do we deal with that? Well, we might come back to that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I thought what we might try and do is just, we're just going to kind of, we're going to look at some parenting generally when we come down to parenting with faith, look at some, some research on, on parenting with faith. So what are some key tasks of parenting? Some of that's a little bit small. I, I've thought of six here um, from some research, and I'll get you to add some more, as you will. What are the key tasks of parenting? So our primary role is to take this little helpless, independent, uh, sorry, dependent being into a state place where they're independent adults. What are some of the tasks. One here is encourage autonomy, that is independence. We want this little baby, this little child that we're growing up to become independent. We don't want them hanging on us all the time. We don't want to be responsible all the time for carrying them. We want to develop them where they have independence and they can say bye and leave. And my mum still goes a bit crook about the way I left home. It was at camp, but not here. It was in Goulburn, South New South Wales, where we grew up. And I just finished year 12 and a friend of mine who was a year or two older was going down to Sydney and he drove up in his car and said, mate, I'm going to Sydney, you want to come with me for the drive? I said, yeah, okay. So, yeah. so I raced in, grabbed my bag and as I ran out the tent, I said, see, mum, I'm going to Sydney. She said, what for? I was just going to Sydney. Jumped in the car and took off, never turned back home. Uh, mum wasn't real happy with that departure. Uh, I got to Sydney and started work at the old Sydney Adventist Hospital and started my new life there. So it wasn't a nice kind of goodbye. But we move towards goodbye, autonomy, we encourage autonomy. The second one, pass on values and faith. Pass on values and faith, as you said. So I thought I should pause there and ask you to help me. If you thought about one or two key values that you would want your child to have, that you'd work hard at developing in your child, what would they be? Okay, we've got honesty. I should have had a whiteboard where we could jot them up. I said, well, honesty, thanks. Just call them out. Honesty. So we're going to work hard. What would be the significance of honesty? Why would that, why would that be important? Over here, thank you. Okay, relationships. Good. Thank so we'll sit with honesty. Thank you. It's, uh, uh, we recognise someone dishonest is just horrible. Relationships. Empathy. All right, let's come back to relationships in a second. But empathy, yes, that sensitive heart, hey, that sensitive heart, uh, the ability to empathise and, and be with people in their pain. Um, sorry? Good work ethics, yes, good work ethic. That reflects, certainly reflects my generation. Thank you for sharing it. I, I was raised to work and work hard, and a good person was someone who worked. Um, but we're aware of the fact that people grew up a little differently with that now and they just, uh, you know, they just wait for uh, Centrelink or something. I don't want to be misunderstood, but yeah, in some areas it's not as strong in some... Thank you. Good work ethic. Sorry? Respect. respect. Yes, respect of self and being able to respect others. Good. So as we raise these, we start thinking, how would I do that? How would I do that as a parent? How would I teach my child to be respectful. There's some ads on TV at the moment, of course, and rightly so, for encouraging young boys how to treat girls, uh, how to treat women. We know that sadly during COVID, they predicted it, there was going to be a possible rise in domestic violence, home violence and sexual assault. Just on the news recently, uh, it was, they looked at the statistics over the last several years and break and enter and th theft and all the usual kind of ones had gone right down. They, they were, um, one had gone down half, f almost 47%, I think, car theft. Why? Because everybody's home during COVID, most probably. What was sad, of course, is that sexual assault and abuse had gone right up. Reliability. Reliability. Thank you, reliability, trust and reliability, good. Excellent, so we've got encouraging autonomy, we've got pass on values and faith, that's significant. Thank you, you've shared some. Someone's mentioned build positive self-esteem, self-acceptance, yes. We know of children who grow up without that sense of value, 
and the struggles they have. I'd love to have tracked a couple of boys who lived opposite us when we lived in another state, in fact, down in South Australia. And numerous times I would come out of the house just as the mum was coming out of her house with the two boys, just two boys, about, I don't know, eight, seven, eight, nine. And she was exceptional in what my mum would call vegetarian swearing. <laughs> You don't do the real thing, so you're vegetarian. You know, so what now, moron? You idiot. What have you forgotten now for crying out aloud? And, and she would just nail these kids. And so often I feel like running over and come and live with me. Not that I'd do it right, but I think I can better that. You know, it's just this put downs constantly. And I just wondered what the long term effect was. What we need to recognize is there's messages and messengers. And I know someone well who got a message from his, his, his mum and dad weren't available for some reason to raise him, so he was raised by his grandmother largely. And she said to him often, you'll never amount to anything. Forget it. And sold him this image, this, this message that he would never amount to anything. And he grew up to believe it. He's tried numerous times to do HC and just before the exams he'll find some reason not to do them. And right through his life, he's almost 50s now, he's never really been long-term employed. He just grew up with the idea. The messenger was a nice lady, I'm sure, but the message she gave was wrong. And we need to differentiate messenger and message. And for many kids, they grow up with wrong messages, nice messengers, but the messages they get are wrong. And they need to rebuild those, rebuild them, reframe them, and design some new ones. So we need to recognise the value of we need, I think, to develop effective communication skills so people can communicate and build relationships, as some of you said. I had the privilege many years ago in going to a 23-week course on communication and relationship skills. And I, I was just a young pastor dude. I, it, was, it wasn't for church people. It was anybody off the street. And the group leader, I, I applied, and the group leader at the start said, how are you going to do with change? And I said, what do, what do you mean? So, how are you going to do with change? And I said, well, I've just come to get resources. You know, you go to workshops and you feel good with your fold of resources and the, you fill it all up with the resources and you go out and you put it on the shelf and you go home and you never look at it again. But you feel good if you've got all these resources. And I thought, I'll get some resources. And for 23 weeks, every Thursday night, for three hours, we'd sit in a group of 24 of us and just talk about relationship skills. And honestly, it was a fabulous course. And I remember going home about halfway through. It was cold. And I sort of crept into bed beside my wife and I took up great courage and I said, have I changed? And tears came to her eyes and I thought that wasn't a good question to ask. <laughs> Put on the whole armour of God, brace yourself. Uh, and she said, yes, you've changed. You're softer, you're calmer, you're better and easier to live with. And it was something I didn't set out to do. But learning some skills. There's four stages of learning. The first one is unconsciously ignorant. We are unconsciously ignorant. We aren't even aware that we're doing it wrong. And then we become consciously ignorant. And we think, hey, I, I'm not doing this right. I've got to, and so then we do the third stage, and it's the most awkward stage, and that's consciously skilled. We, we, we consciously practice new skills until they become unconsciously skilled. So I remember going down, to learning to snow ski as a kid, and as a young bloke, and we'd go down and, and uh, we, we learned to ski fast down the hill, right? But we didn't really learn to stop. So to stop, you'd fall over in the snow, hopefully soft, or you'd run into somebody, pre preferably someone in pink, and then say, oops, sorry, and, and that would just stop. And I took a youth group, a, a group down to the snow, and I learned that I could get free lessons because I took a group to the snow and I thought, I don't need lessons, I can ski. And then I thought, no, don't be an idiot, uh, go and learn some. So I went to lesson. And this instructor, this was back quite a few years, we didn't have a lot of uh, Australian instructors in, they're mostly European. So this man says to me, today we want you to walk up the hill and stand there. And when we wave, we want you to ski down, we watch you and put you into groups. So I walked up the hill and waited. And when he waved, I skied down the hill thinking he's going to put me in the, in the advanced class. It was the first time I've heard an instructor swear. <laughs> and he said, oh, boop, stocks are over there. And he pointed over there. And here's all these little dudes with crash helmets and these tiny little kids. He's talking to the wrong bloke. Over there. So I, 
humbly skated this group, and the new instructor says, today we are going to learn to stop. I thought that could be handy. <laughs> today we learn to snowplow. You know, snow plow. So we learned to snow plow, and I could stop a little. And each time I went back, I had more and more lessons because I'd always wanted a parallel. You know, parallel skiing doesn't look so cool. And I, I tried that one time without learning, and, and you should see my ankle. Um, so I, learnt, I finally learned to do that. It was, I, I, we learned to ski backwards and on one ski and all this crazy stuff. And finally, and I remember one day I was, got off the toe, and uh, I was by myself, and it's pretty boring skiing by yourself. So when it was a blue cow, looked over and there's about five or six of my mates. So, stop right in front of them, sprayed them with snow. And the guy said, how'd you do that? I don't know, just did it. <laughs> Unconsciously skilled. And I think in parenting, we, you know, we can often be unconsciously ignorant. And then we realize, I'm not doing this right. And we become unconscious, we consciously unskilled, and we move into that third stage, and that's the awkward stage. The tricky with parenting thing is we're kind of in that stage for so long, aren't we? You know, we're in the kind of consciously school because we grow with our kids. So when we start off with a little baby, we, we learn the skills of nappies and, and bottles and stuff, and then we advance to trying to understand what they're saying and why they're crying. Is it a sore tummy or sick or bored or tired? Or, and then we learn that, and then we move. We're constantly learning. But we do need to learn. And I think communication skills are just so vital. Develop responsibility, someone said that, and build effective relationships. We want, and tomorrow we're going to spend a whole lot of, have a lot of fun looking at relationships. Sean and I were talking about that, and I thought that's pretty broad. We'll have some fun. We're going to start off with relationships generally. Do you realize the significance of relationships? Loneliness can literally break your heart. We are designed for relationships. It's built. When God said it's not good that you should be alone, he wasn't joking. The research is clear as a bell. I want to talk about that tomorrow. Then we're going to talk in about pre-marriage pre relationships and then some marriage stuff. I want to spend a little bit of time looking at some really fascinating research come out of the States a few years ago on marriage. Um, I'll introduce it real quick to you. John Gottman, you might have heard of him. Um, set up a love lab in Seattle. Sounds dodgy, but it was marvellous. He had all these couples coming in and he had uh, three cameras on them from nine in the morning to nine at night. And he said, oh, all I wanted to do was discover why some marriages dive and some thrive. And he said, now I know. He said, you give me 15 minutes with a couple and I'll predict with a 91% accuracy whether they'll divorce or not. Karen and I haven't had the interview. Um, <laughs> and when I first read that, I thought, nah. The more I read this guy and researched his stuff and worked with it, it uh, he's, he's fabulous. So I want to share with you what he called about the disasters and the masters. And what he did, he tracked these couples over 15 or more years. Had all this video footage of hours and hours of couples just sitting there reading the newspaper and chatting and talking. He had facial specialists come in, what emotion are they feeling now? He, it's just a massive study. And he tracked all the couples that sadly didn't make it what he calls the disasters of marriage and found what are these couples doing that leads them down there. I need to share that with you. Then he discovered all the successful couples, the couples that stayed long-term married, what did they do? And I'll try and fit in that in a short while tomorrow. So I hope that's helpful and uh, we'll dive in there. I just want to, uh, look, I'm sure you could add to some. Um, let's plug on. Um, what I want to talk to you is about perfect parents for a sec. There's no such thing as perfect parenting. If a young couple or if a young lady comes to me and says, Traff, I found the perfect partner, I say to her, go and marry him immediately. But as soon as you do, know, you know no longer it's perfect because there's no such thing as perfect people, is there? We're all learning and there's no such thing as perfect parenting. It doesn't exist. So if you're walking around thinking, I've got to be the perfect parent, take a moment, forgive yourself, take a breath and start again. I'd like to encourage you as good enough parenting. That might sound a little bit good enough parenting. Right? Perfect parenting will kill you. The, the guilt we feel about not doing it perfectly. We're, we're learning as we go. Let's face it, Dr. Arch Hart, a former deeply committed Christian psychologist, sadly died recently, fabric, written a number of books, you'll find them. He put this together, he said, perfect parents never make mistakes, so they never really model humility and repentance. They never make wrong decisions, so they don't teach children how to be flexible and change what they are doing if it doesn't work. They never lose their temper, so they create tremendous guilt in their children when their children feel angry. They never admit any wrong, so their children have impossible standards to live up to. 
They always know what is right, so children don't get to discuss or debate the rights and wrongs of things. There is never any honest and open dialogue in the home. Perfect parents always correct children for what they've done wrong, so children never enjoy that marvellous feeling that they've gotten away with something. <laughs> kind of like that. Okay. <laughs> and always remember past mistakes and hold them up to their children to see so that children will strive to be perfect themselves. And I thought that was really neat. And the risk for us as perfect parenting is that we don't always model what it's like to be human, what it's like to be normal, struggling with life, and we need to apologise to our kids. Sorry, kids, I've got that wrong. Let's redo that. And that's OK. Let's talk about some patterns of parenting, um, the way we understand how we parent. They've done a fair bit of research in this over the years. And I'll just share this with you. Uh, the terminology is a little bit interesting, but let's have a look at it. What they discovered is that there's various, there's sort of this profile of, of looking at it. And these are the terms they use. So high protection, if we are in a high protection model, what that suggests is that we are very overprotective. We are rigid, intrusive, restriction of independence and autonomy. There's a lot of parental anxiety. So if you and I did a test and they said, look, I'm sorry, but your high protection would be very protective. We're most probably what we call helicopter parents or drone parents. We're just hovering all the time, Pro incredibly protective. We don't allow our kids a lot of space to move. We're just there in their faces and, and there's a lot of rigidity rules. So this is what we mean by high protection. Low protection sounds first up like we don't care. You, know, you just go and do your thing, kids. No, this is the, the term here means promotion of independence and autonomy, promoting personal responsibility. So I want you to keep that in mind because when you see low protection, you think, oh, that's really that's not good. No, it's good. All right? This is a way of saying, kids, let's learn to be responsible, and we start disciplining in that way. We're going to come to that in a jiff. So low protection isn't I don't care. It's about promoting independence and autonomy. Then on the side wings, high care, of course, is parental warmth, care and acceptance, a lot of love and genuine just empathy and all the rest. Low care is parental coldness, neglect and rejection. You might know somebody who fits those quadrants. What they then suggested is that we can look at these and, 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 and there they are, there, there's sort of the definitions of them that you can see. And then if we go to this next slide, this is the terms they use. So somebody who's controlled parenting is a lot of high protection, overprotectiveness, rigidity, intrusiveness, etc. But there's also parental coldness, the neglect. Right? And, and neglectful parenting is where there's parental coldness and neglect, and there's a lot of promotion of independence and autonomy. So imagine this, so I'm just going to get you to think around this for a sec and let's see if we can discover what might be some of the characteristics of this and what might occur for kids growing up in this kind of family. Then we're going to move on and look at families of faith particularly. Okay, so neglectful parenting, constrained parenting is high protection and high care. So there's a lot of nice warmth and care and acceptance and love, but there's still that sort of real overprotective kind of part. Optimal parenting, high care, a lot of parental warmth, care and acceptance, and there's also promotion of, of independence and autonomy. So let's take a moment. I want you to look at these for a second. I'll get you to help us again. Let's, let's dive over to someone as a controlled parent. I'm only going to do this for a couple of minutes. A controlled parent. How might they come across? Overprotective, intrusive, rigid. They restrict independence. And it's a bit cold and neglectful. What, what might a child's reactions be growing in that kind of family? Resentful, Resentful yes, good, resentful. Fear, Fear yes. Rejection of, parental rejection of parental values. Think about those keywords. Fear, rejection, yeah. Acceptance, exactly. Okay, so the risks for the kid is the child reaction is they don't care, that is, I feel betrayed. Why don't they love me? I'm not really lovable. A lot of criticism, etc. The child's behaviour, they said, is precocious, 
impulsive, undisciplined, disorganised, easily frustrated, egocentric, they tend to start centering on themselves. Thank you, yes. Less Sorry? Less honest. Less honest, thank you. Good. All right, starting at the order, let's move across to constrained parenting. So there's a lot of overprotective, rigid, rigid etc., but there's also a lot of the warmth and care. How might the child grow up in this family? What might be going on? There's a lot of love and care, but it's also this sort of control. Thank you. Inability to make their own decisions. Good. Mum and Dad are making them all for them. Yep. Okay, rejection of the parents' rules. Good. They're going to be pushed by their parents, high expectations, afraid of closeness and warmth, possibly. Parents, I'm so responsible. The kids might grow up, why must I work so hard to get your love and approval? I must be stupid or inadequate. This is some of the research. What I think does or feel doesn't matter. I never tell you anything. I resent being pushed around. So they suggest the possible behaviour is withdrawn, secretive, disrespectful, as you've shared, frequent anger outbursts, no initiative, no cooperation, moody, provocative. So there's, there's some stuff coming through. Let's dive down to the neglectful parent. Um, I think if there's... A, which, which style of parenting might be the highest risk? If there's high risk here, which one? It could go either way, but which one particularly? The neglectful, yeah. So, the, so there's... Uh, who cares? Like, you know, parental coldness, neglect and rejection and promotion of independence. Off you go, go and do your thing, who cares? And uh, the kids feel ignored, of course, unlovable, don't respect their parents, I hope someone will love me. And I think these kids are incredibly at risk. Of course, the optimal parenting is where we want to be. Warm, affectionate, caring, but also promoting independence and autonomy as it's appropriate to do so. So we sort of move into freedom as they do, more and more letting it go. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and you might want to do some more research on this, quite a bit out there. I just jotted down some basic principles of parenting. Then we're going to look at um, some, some families of faith, looking at the, the, the spiritual concept. Um, I put down you are the parents. <laughs> I have to keep remember, reminding us that I'm the parent. I don't want my children to be responsible for parenting. And we know that sadly in some families, due to some ill health, some mental health issues, alcoholism, etc., often the children become the parents and take on a parental role. But we generally don't want that to happen. We want our kids to be kids as appropriate and we're the parents, okay? And we parent appropriately for the age that they're going through. Number two, we've always said we grow with our kids. Um, that's one of the tough things. We grow with our kids. And I discovered we had a daughter first up, a little girl, Kelly, and uh, she's a mum of three girls now. Her eldest is 15 and she's taller than my wife. Uh, she's a big tall girl and uh, we miss them terribly in the US. I hadn't seen them for three years because of COVID. They came and uh, holidayed with us a few uh, months back. It was just so good to see them. And when, when Kelly did something that I felt wasn't so cool, I used to just frown at her and she'd kind of just wilt and, and sort of make a change. And then my son came along and I thought, well, I guess I'll just do the same. So if he did something and I would frown at it, he'd frown back at me. <laughs> I thought, that's not working very well. No, I, I kind of rewrite the rules. And you'll find, even within a, one family, the kids are different. And I think about it, I grew up in a family of three boys, and then 16 years later, my next brother came along. It's pretty embarrassing when, uh, you know, you're 16 and you walk along the street and your mum's with you and she's very pregnant. So my older brother and I'd walk that side of the street and mum would walk that side of the street. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, he was one and a half when I left home. We're all so different. We're all, you can see the fish at trade, but we're all quite different. And we're all different within a family, and growing with our kids is, is a challenge. And <laughs> I, I remember one time my son was, was, was hitting our daughter. So I gave him a bit of a clip and said, mate, don't hit your daughter, uh, your sister. And he said, so it's okay for you to hit me, but not okay for me to hit her. And I thought, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that together. So, yeah, we grow with our kids and we learn different ways of, of, of dealing with that. Okay, discipline needs to be considered discipling, not punishment. It's the same word. 
Discipline comes from the word disciple. And one of the biggest challenges for us when it comes to parenting is how do we discipline our children? And sadly, for a lot of us, discipline means punishment. But I think if we can just twist it a little, to just reframe it and see it as discipling, I think it can take on a little bit of a different feel. There's a whole bag of stuff out there on, on disciplining. I encourage you to read it. One little one I want to share with you, which I think was really cool. This guy came up with the concept of the stoplights. And he said, in our home, we work with stoplights. And he said, there's red, orange, and green. So we sat down with our kids and said, kids, what's the green light stuff? What can we do where you get the green light? There's no problem, you can do that. So you can play Nintendo for half an hour. You can run around, you can ride your bikes outside. What about riding your bikes inside? No, that's a red light. All right, so they wrote down all the red light. What things that you can't do? And what's an orange light? An orange light means that you are at a risky kind of place. What you're doing now could lead to a red light. And when it gets to a red light, this is what's going to happen. So they sat down with their kids and not only worked out what was green and what was red, but what would happen if they hit the red? And that's often what we don't do. We say, you can't do this, we can't do that, but we don't always talk about, if you do, what are the consequences? And we need to work far more with consequences rather than punishment and get our kids to do that. And it's amazing when you ask kids, I want you to write down, what should we do? What would be best to do in our family when you do a red light thing? It's amazing what the kids come up with. And sometimes they're more tougher than the parents. Uh, so he would work on the green, and I thought that was, I thought that was kind of cool. I, I wish I'd had that when I was a parent. I thought the green, orange and red was pretty cool. And, and you'd need to nut those out with your kids. Um, so, yeah. Uh, try to avoid helicopter or drone parenting. That's where we're hovering all the time and just hanging low. Uh, the older the child, the wider the boundaries. Uh, what do I mean by that? As our children grow, we're, we, see, we don't want our kid to get to 18 where we've constantly controlled and made decisions for them and yes, no, and this is what you have to do and then say bye. They haven't learnt to do that. And I remember Kelly came to me one time, and I just, I just an example for me that, that worked at the time. Kelly came to me, she was about 15, 14, 15, and she said, Dad, Jenny's asked me to have a sleepover. Uh-huh, that's cool. Who, 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 who might be there? Oh, some of the kids from class. And, and uh, I said, well, what do you think? What, what are you thinking about it? Well, yeah, yeah, I think I'd like to go. Uh-huh, all right. Tell you what, have a think about it and come back to me in an hour's time and let me know what you're thinking. So she went off and she came back in an hour's time. She said, Dad, I, I don't think I'll go. Okay? What are you thinking? And she explained why she didn't want to go. And I found that a helpful thing to do. I wanted her to start owning, sort of thinking through the four. If I said, no, you're not going, bang, that's it. And she's angry and she slams the door. But negotiating and giving her that room and said, if you go, that's cool, I'll be there. I wish we had time to do some family sculpturing. Um, let me just pause there while I think, but it'd be great to just call some of you out and we'd build a family here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna build it with my words. I hope you can picture it. On the extremes in parenting, we have what we call families. We do family sculpturing. We have an enmeshed family or a disengaged family way over here. And a disengaged family is where dad's there and mum's there and one child's there and one child's there. Where's dad? Dunno. It's disengaged. There's no connections. And we know families who grub like that. Okay. And so, where's... I don't know. He's out in the sheds. Where's mum? Oh, kitchen, I suppose. Yeah. Where's your bro? Oh, who cares? Motorbike. Yeah. So it's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. Right. And enmeshed family is the opposite, where everybody's kind of locked in together. And I would model that by just getting it all... It's too hot, so I won't do it. All sort of hug and hold in tight. And we'd put a son, 18-year-old, or so a, a girl, let's do a girl. We'd put an 18-year-old girl in the middle of this family and ask her, what's it like living in this family, this en enmeshed family, where mum and dad make the rules and everything's decided as a group? And, and I said, what, what's something you just want to do? And she'd say, freedom, freedom. And if we have an 18-year-old son in the disengaged family, He's out on his motorbike doing what he likes anytime, doesn't care, no, doesn't have to be responsible for anything. Right? And this Jim, this 18 year old son, meets up at a restaurant with 18 year old Jenny and this family and they start talking. And Jenny said, D Did your father bring us something? No. Nah. And, and she talked, 
and she, he just describes his family where he can just do what he wants and here's her own. She says, wow, freedom. <laughs> and as he talks to her, you know, the, the phone rings and it's, she picks up the phone, it's dad, you're right, honey? Okay, if you're really cool, I'll come and get you if you like. What, you, you just yell when you're ready, I'll come and pick you up. And he says, wow, all that love and care. Oh, whew. And so they, they, they're attracted, aren't they? And they start going together and they get married. They go on their honeymoon and they come back. It's Sunday morning, it's washing day. <laughs> and what does she expect? Who does the washing in her family? Everybody does the washing, right? And where's her husband? Run, run, he's off on his back. <laughs> Okay, remember the importance of emotional intelligence. We, we don't have time for it. There was a guy, John Gottman, who I mentioned earlier, did a whole bag of stuff on parenting. If we had time, we might mention it. And he said, parents who work with the emotions of their children are way in front of any other style of parenting. And what he mean by that is that he taught, they would teach their children to define their emotions. So when a kid was feeling sad, they said, you are feeling sad. And they would honour that emotion and work with that emotion. Allow the child to experience sadness rather than saying, don't you cry, only babies cry. Yeah. Bit tough. <laughs> if a child was angry, that's a honey, you're angry just now. And anger is often about what's unfair. If I'm driving and someone cuts me off, I get angry, right? Because that's unfair. He's just oblivious, he just drives on. I get angry because, and if someone says, why are you angry? I don't know, but if I say, what's unfair just now, sometimes I can answer that. I think, and they work with children who are angry, happy, sad, they defined all their emotions. Some years ago, another pastor and I, we had the joy of working with other pastors. We, we trained pastors in a variety of areas. We did marriage enrichment workshops, we did basic counselling skills, we did LGB awareness training, domestic violence training. And when we did basic counselling, we spent quite a while on emotions because when we're working with people, we, they're emotional. And just this morning, as I was coming down from Peachester, a friend of mine from the US rang, he's about to retire. He was a chaplain for many years in the Army, US Army. And he was describing how he's training pastors today and tomorrow in Canada on dealing with sadness and grief. Because sometimes a lot of pastors and all of us sometimes feel uncomfortable when, we, when someone's hurting. And true story, when my younger brother, my younger brother died at 45 of Alzheimer's and I was sitting beside him on the last weekend of his life, hospital on the Gold Coast, and a pastor came in. And the, the, my brother was on the bed there and I was just sitting here in a chair and there was a couple of spare chairs and he came in and he sat down beside me and he said, oh, this is horrible. And he did, truly, he sat there for 15 minutes and didn't say a word. <laughs> It was the most powerful support, it was just fabulous. Another pastor came in, true story, another pastor came in, he stood at the end of the bed and sort of wrung his hands like this and said, oh, um, I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> um, and my immediate response was, see that door there? <laughs> and I had to comfort him because I had to deal, support him in his anxiety. And w when people are hurting and, and, and sad, it's a great skill to recognise and stay with that emotion, particularly for our kids. So if you'd like to look it up, it's just emotion-focused parenting. Um, the value of building and sustaining traditions, real quick. This father uh, and mum didn't have a lot of money, but they, every year they took their t three teenage boys down to the snow. And they saved up, it's, ex oh, it's expensive to go to the snow and skiing, always has been. And, Every year that they'd save up. And he, and he writes this story and he said, as I was going through my parenting years, my mates would turn up and say, hey, Bob, come and have a look at the house extension. And he said, oh, I wish I could do that. Come and have a look at the new car. Mate, just put in a swimming pool and they'd describe all these things that they'd done. He felt, I felt this guilt of not being able to do that for my kids, but we took them every year to the snow. He said, what was, what was interesting is when my kids were 19, 20, 21, 22, my friends would come around and there's our kids and their mates sitting down watching snow videos and laughing and, and these other mates would say, wow, look at your kids. I don't know where my kids are. And he reflected on that and he said, I think that little tradition of going to the snow every year anchored us as kids. And his conclusion is correct. 
there's quite a lot of research now on the value of little traditions, little rituals. And if you do, they did a, a huge study in the States a variety of years ago. Um, Joe and Alice Beam and Nick and Nancy Stanay, they studied 24,000 families across 14, so many, how many countries? And it was just a huge study, massive, looking for the six signs of a healthy family. And the last one was they valued traditions and rituals. It's a major belief. So d if you just got this little neat ritual that you do in a family keep, but you know, if you have a birthday and you have a cake, make sure you do that. And if your kid passes an exam, have a cake, have a party, and when they get their license, have a party, hide the car, but have a party. <laughs> uh, you know, just do stuff, eh? Have little rituals, little morning rituals. Uh, stories come to mind. My my wife's dad was a double uh, grandpa, so he was a double amputee. He was uh, ploughing with the old horse and cart, many a horse and plough, many many years ago, of course. And the horses shied and took off and cut his leg off. And then several years later, he got gangrene, another one, so he lost that leg as well. And when my wife, too, when she stayed with them, she'd hear her grandfather get up in the morning and hear this plonk as he sort of dropped out of bed. And she'd hear, hear him sort of scraping his way out to the kitchen and she'd hear the jug go on and he'd make his wife a cup of tea. And then she'd hear this shh, shh, and he'd slide the cup of tea along the floor, then catch up on his bottom, then slide it and hand it up to his wife. What a, what a fabulous ritual. And guess who gets up every morning and makes a hot drink for my wife? Uh, <coughs> you know, I, I couldn't let her down, could I? Uh, <laughs> and it's become a ritual. I, I go out and I make her a hot drink and, and take it to her every morning, but I don't slide on my bottom, I can walk. Um, but it's just fair, but little rituals are just... So don't, don't minimise them, right? Don't minimise them. All right. In the last few bit, I just want to share with you a few reflections from research on faith stuff. This is the tough challenge. Let me share with you this statement from Scripture. Jesus talks to his brother. His brother said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Now, you, may not, you might have forgotten, but Jesus had a number of brothers. There were five of them, or four brothers, five brothers. He also had sisters. And on one occasion, you remember Jesus was t talking to people in the house and, he's, and someone said, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? Anybody who believes in me are my brothers and brothers. What was that like for the family? But Jesus had brothers and sisters. We don't know their birth order. We know the names of their brothers, James and Jude, Judas, Jude, and Simon. But they didn't believe in him. Now let's notice this text. Then they returned to Jerusalem. This is after the resurrection. When they arrived, they went straight upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Fascinating. So his non-believing brothers who didn't believe him, something's happened. Now, let's face it, if you and I were walking down the street and our brother or sister, our sibling, was walking along beside us saying, I'm the Prime Minister of Australia, I'm the legitimate... <laughs> you and I would walk the other side of the street and think about what medications would be best to help with that. Right? Jesus' brothers are walking around town with their own brother, half-brother, saying, I'm the Messiah. Are you kidding me? What would it be like for these brothers to get to the place where they say, my half-brother is the long-promised Messiah? All right, well, let's go a bit further. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, James 1.1. 1, 1. That, according to research, is pretty sure that, in fact, is Jesus' brother. That's Jesus' half-brother, James. And there's good research to show that's, that's James, Jesus' brother. And you'll notice Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother to James. His name was Judas. You can understand why they changed it to Jude. Here's Jesus' two half-brothers who were unbelievers who've now become believers to the place where they say, a servant of Jesus Christ. That word servant can either be servant or slave. The Greek word is doulos. It's most probably equally translatable as slave. What would it be like 
for Jude and James to get to the place where they say, my half-brother is the Messiah and I dedicate my life to him. It's huge. All right, now notice this verse. The disciples began to stare at one another, wondering who was the unfaithful disciple. The Last Supper. Unbelievers become believers. Believers become unbelievers. We would never predict it. And one of the biggest challenges for us as parents is if we had to predict which child will stay faithful. <laughs> I wouldn't want to predict. We would long for all our kids to be faithful. When my dad died at 83, I made a quiet commitment that I would meet him at the tree up in heaven. The tricky thing is I'm sure that's the meeting place for a heck of a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so I hope I can find him. And it's with our kids. We want our kids to be there. W what can we do to... If there's anything difficult to predict, it's which kids will remain faithful to their spiritual foundations and which ones will walk away. And I put down here, there doesn't seem to be a certificate of guarantee that you can take out at birth to know for sure that your son or daughter will be with you in the church pew. I wish there was. Well, what scripture text might help us? Here's one. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your kids. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I think we could translate to say, just take every opportunity you can to share the love of Jesus grab every opportunity when you think of Jesus and you, it's interesting when you read James and Jude both James and Jude and Jesus all three of them have fabulous word pictures if you want to if you, I don't know if you're familiar with the voice translation and you certainly will be with the message but when you read James and Jude in those translations you should hear the word pictures they're fabulous it's just amazing I think three brothers had the tray of using word pictures to teach Jesus used cows and sheep and everything to, to talk about himself and, and the gospel and I think we can when we're driving down the road whenever we just when we get up when we lie down we grab every chance to share with our kids the love of Jesus and we need to share them the love of Jesus especially I love this text for you know that we dealt with you as a father deals with his own children encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory three things encouraging comforting and urging to live lives worthy of God we encourage and we're so good at put-downs. <laughs> Aussies are good at that. There was a true story about two guys who worked at the South Pacific Division a number of years ago who were best of mates, but they were known for caning each other. They're always paying each other out. It was just this fun. That's what we do as Aussies. They went over to the, ge to the general conference for meetings, and they were sitting outside the meeting place waiting for the meeting to start, and, and it wasn't starting. You know, time passed, and they just, so they just sat there ribbing each other what they were doing. Finally, this American gentleman came out and said, Good brothers, uh, thank you for being here for the meeting, but we feel reluctant to start until you men sort out your differences and then come inside for the meeting. <laughs> yeah, they took them serious. These guys laughed and said, Nah, this is just how we do it. And Aussie, we do put downs, but the tricky thing is we went, went always sometimes careful of the boundaries, and we need to be sensitive, encouraging. Here's a, some research for us just to share. There is overwhelming evidence that parents are almost always the single most significant determined factor in the development of their children. That's Mark DeVries, family-based youth ministry. This one from the same author. Parents who simply talk about their faith in the home and who involve their teens in serving alongside them can actually double and sometimes even triple their children's chances of living out their faith as adults talk about their faith in the home and involve their teens in serving alongside them. Um, I know some of you may have been Springers when I was associate pastor at Springwood, particularly caring for the youth. I tried often as possible to find projects for the kids to do. And I, I regret that I didn't find more. But I've discovered that when you get teens doing stuff, sometimes we concentrate on being. This is who you need to be. When it comes to, this is who you need to do. This is what you need to do. And I think if we can get kids doing faith. While we didn't come up with a surefire formula, this, these two researchers were looking at, you know, what's the research tell us about how to build a child of faith? One thing was obvious. Those who stuck with their faith had a half dozen mentors present during their growing up years. 
the value of having mentors, people who walk beside us and encourage us, who are there for us, who give us the listening ear as kids when we're struggling with some stuff. This one, to an adolescent, you are their Bible. Your lived out theology, how you talk about people, faith, politics, money or church will be the word that your child will study and learn from the most. The old adage, Christianity is not taught so much it's caught, is never truer than during early adolescence. All right, it's 10.30. Maybe I'll take one minute to share this little bit and then we'll conclude and I'll get you to tell me where I've got it wrong. I'd <laughs> love to hear from you. I found this article by Nancy Montgomery, How to Raise a Spiritual Child. I thought I'd share it with you just to finish. This is one person's suggestions. You can add more, I'm sure. If we had more time together, we could all sit around and nut this out a bit. But what the research tells us is that we may not come up with the answer. Believers become unbelievers, unbelievers become believers, and we're not always sure of the factors. I remember one mum many years ago when I was in youth work came to me really distressed and she said, I'm really worried about my youngest daughter. Uh -huh, tell me about it. Well, she's listening to rock music, and when I sort of checked out the music, it wasn't rock music, but to her it was rock music. And she's doing this and she's doing that, and I thought, okay. And tell me about your other daughter, and other daughter, older daughter. Well, she's leading out in Sabbath school, and she's, you know, and she was just this model. She always obeys, and she was a model child. And I left that particular church, and about two years later, I heard that the youngest daughter, the one that she was most troubled about, was leading primary Sabbath school in the church. The older one that she was so proud of had fallen in love with some truck in that, darted off at Central and, and given away everything. You thought, wow. And sometimes we need a bit of elastic. <laughs> I've thought of a story, Sean, that I shouldn't share, but I will. I got into trouble at college for marking around. A few of us mates got into trouble. We didn't do anything bad. We just, you know, it was somebody's birthday and we chained them together and water, hosed them down, we, you know, that sort of stuff. Had to go to discipline committee. And I went to discipline committee and we had to do some hard labour or something. I came out and I met a, a lecturer who'd been there for years. And he said, Travis, I said, I've just come out of discipline committee. He said, let me tell you something. He said, I've been here for years, as you know, and you see theology students come to Avondale and they've got the Bible up under their arm and they've kind of just got their tie and they're just, you know, and you think they're going to be our future leaders and they're, they're just cool. Then you see these guys with hair and mucking around and you think, oh, what chance have our church has got? Let me tell you something. 20 years later, you know who the conference presidents are and the administrators are? It's all these crazy guys with hair. All the straight guys have all gone. And I thought about my own class. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be misunderstood about many of our class that I thought, gee, I shouldn't be like them. They've all gone. A lot of them just walked away. And I think they were just so rigid and, and, and kind of just no elastic. Two guys in our class never laughed. Never laughed. Because there's no record of scripture of Jesus laughing. So we'd crack jokes in front of them and laugh and carry on. We were, we were somewhat bad about that. They laughed. One guy lasted six months in ministry, another one a year, and they left. People, I say that just to say we need some elastic, we need some space, we need some fun. Parenting's got to be fun. And there's a text in Scripture, David, the psalmist says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. For a lot of kids, it's just, I was sad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. We need to make God times memorable times and good times. Work hard at making God times memorable times and good times, okay? If we're too heavy. Okay. All right, so here's a few things that she shared. Introduce spirituality early on. She said, we're introducing spiritual practice early on, such as lighting candles, singing songs. Your child will view them as a natural part of life and you'll have a spiritual influence on him. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll go quick. Help them believe these things are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing. And that little statement that's a bit hard to read there says, My wife and I try to help our daughters see that God is somewhere, somehow here with us. We look for his presence in the concrete, sensory ways and, and just give some examples. Don't pretend to have all the answers. This is this lady's ideas. It's okay to admit that some questions people spend their whole lives trying to figure out. This is one of them. We don't have all the answers. Um, yeah. Use daily events to teach spirituality. Big ideas don't always require big actions. Uh, instill appreciation of nature. We, we do that well. I think that's something we do well. Involve them. K get kids a sense of spirituality by being involved and there are many opportunities to engage them. Tell them stories. Jesus was always telling stories. 
Build on family traditions. We've already mentioned that rituals and traditions are key. Show them your spirituality. How we live and what we make time for speaks volumes to kids about what's important. Uh, worship together as a family. We, we, we do that in various ways. Can I just make a real quick comment there? When, when our kids were growing up, and again, I don't present this because I got it all right, but there came time for family worship, and I found that pretty challenging to come up with something every night that was fun. So we said to them, and I said, kids, we want you to do some family worship now. You're old enough to do that. So here's a little roster. Let's do mum, mum Monday night, dad Tuesday night, Kelly Wednesday night, Jay Thursday night. And how would that be? That'd be cool, yeah, okay. And, and okay, so I remember I came out of the house on time and Jay, our son, looked at the fridge. Ah, it's my time for worship. And he hooked down to his room and disappeared. And this is going to be fun. And he came out, he had it written out. He said, welcome, dad. So I had to give a welcome, you know. <laughs> song. And, and Kelly, and so Kelly had to choose the song. It was priceless. Well, but he'd written it all out, and there it all was. And, and another time, our neighbours weren't Adventists; they were Gentiles, uh, lovely folk, but they were they were Philistine heritage. And um, <clears throat> and we invited them over for dinner. And I thought, oh, let, let's do family worship. So I said, look, we have this little ritual. Is that okay? Just we have this little ritual. Would it be okay before our kids go to bed? Sure. So we, we sing this little song. So we start singing this song. And our daughter spoke up quite out and said, Jim's not singing. <laughs> this is our neighbour, Jim. Oh, sorry. So as you saw, I remember a kid from Sunday school and he joined in singing the song. And I thought, oh, Jim, it's embarrassing. Because, it, it, you know, see, if we, if we have to dream it up all the time, man, give it to the kids. Fun stuff. You never know what's going to happen. Make them a part of a community. And here we go. Make it fun. I was glad. Let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm going to share with you a text and we're done. Fancy talking for over an hour. Good. Man, guy's got to be crazy. All right, here we go. Hey, uh, you're most probably all pretty tired because you're sitting up watching the, the special service last night, the, the funeral service of the Queen. Pretty impressive if you watched it. Man. Okay. When they came to Bethsaida, a group brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. So Jesus guided the man out of the village, away from the crowd, and he spat on the man's eyes and touched them. What do you see? Jesus said. The man said, I see people, but they look like trees, walking trees. It's all out of focus. So Jesus touched his eyes again. And then when the man looked up, he could see everything clearly. As far as I know, that's the only story in Scripture where there's a time-space element between the uh, announcement of, of something wrong and Jesus' healing. He touches him once. What do you see? Oh. Touches him the second time. <laughs> people, I'm convinced that there's a bag of people out there, kids, adults, aged people, and for some unknown reason, it's out of focus. Jesus has touched them the first time. They know of his love. They know about Jesus, but for some reason, it's out of focus. And I'm convinced that God in his time will touch them the second time, and they'll see it clearly. And I commend that to you. My final paragraph. This is Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. She was the 23rd child in her family. <laughs> if you've only got four or five and you think you're doing well, you're chicken food. You've only just kicked off, right? She was the 23rd child in her family. When she married, she married a clergyman. They had 19 children, 10 of whom survived. This is what she says. Help me, Lord, to remember that religion is not to be confined to the church, nor exercised only in prayer and meditation but that everywhere I am in thy presence. Thank you. It's been lovely to be with you. God bless. Uh, Dr. Traff, well, you've really enjoyed your presentation. I know that uh, if we had two or three hours, <laughs> we'd still be going and it'd still be incredibly relevant. Thank you. Uh, for those of you uh, tomorrow, uh, Traff will actually be presenting again on building healthy relationships in a pretty broad thing. Traff could have actually presented all week on all of those ones. There's so many different yeah. topics. But uh, it's come time for Q&A. If you do need to get going, we're fully okay with that as well. But uh, if you do want to hang around, this is a really good time to uh, hear your questions and listen to Traff's response. Uh, Pastor Paul and I have some mic. So just put your hand up. We'll come straight to you. I'll do my best. No promises. Thank you. There's no questions. They're still thinking or it's time to go. Thank you for hanging in for an hour. I, I, I hope that's been helpful.
One over here, thank you. Um, hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, parenting, uh, parenting with faith against the influences of the world right now. Because while you, you classify those parenting, I know, I know sometimes we have to the happy medium as well. Mm -hmm. And you find sometimes you may try to teach with love and everything and you feel like you're pushing against the peer. Mm. Uh, peers of the world, you know, they go to school, they go to different places where you're not, but they come back with different teachings and mm -hmm. you have to push against that. Mm -hmm. And you find sometimes you have to use that strong parenting that is not what you want to be, but mm -hmm. the day you find yourself pushing back real yes, hard. Yes, yeah, thank you, so true. Uh, look, one of the things we didn't talk about today was, was parenting now in the social media world. And there's people more skilled in that than I am, but you're right, there's some incredible challenges for parenting now because of social media. It's, it's just huge. And uh, I recently with a, spent several time, quite a few days with families just doing stuff and the teenage kids, they just, this is all they did all day, you know. Um, I was shopping recently and the checkout lady, the girl, just a, t a young girl, she was amazing. She was, you know, you know the, and it's, it's a lot quicker now. Beep, beep, beep. So as she's passing the food across, she's mostly, you know, the j boss wasn't around. She's on a mobile with a phone. Beep, beep, beep. Sh sending this message. She was so quick. I, I do, a pre oh, wrong one. You know, you know. <laughs> they grow up with them, and, and it's just huge. And what I heard you saying is that sometimes when, the kids bring stuff to the home from out there and we feel uncomfortable with that and we feel as if, no, this is what we want and it gets a, a bit like this and we need to be a bit stronger than we'd like to be. That makes a lot of sense. And we feel that, don't we? That hurts. We'd rather not have to work sort of so hard to, to get across what we feel is important. Um, I think from my only thought would be is just continue to model that openness. Continue to model as much as you can. I, I'm wanting you to get this for this reason. This is where I'm coming from. Tell me a bit more about what you're hearing and try and keep the table open. Um, sometimes we do, we feel as if we've got to get the place where this is it. And sometimes we do, we draw the line and say, kids, this is where, and I tell you why I'm drawing the line here. This is why it's really important to me. And I want to hang on to that. I do feel very uncomfortable letting that go. You're pushing that fine. The research suggests that if we throw away the boundaries, the kids, you know, they need boundaries to push against, but they need to get a little bit elastic, especially as they get older, we, we, we shift them. But if they're rigid and stuck there, that's when we can run into problems. So we, we've got, we don't give away that boundary line, that, that value that we're hanging on to, and we, we declare it as clear as we can, knowing that they're pushing against it. That's okay, it hurts to have that push, but that's important for them to push because that's what they want to do. That's part of that independence journey. So if we can picture it as this is all normal, this is all normal. And I, there were times when my son would come home and he'd throw his bag across the floor and storm up the stairs. And I think, ah, oh, Lord, thank you for my normal child. He was angry, he was frustrated with school and and uh, come down here, no, just let him, let him unwind when it's time that we can talk about it. It's normal to have pain and hurt and anger and frustration and, and we model that in a way of this is how we best deal with it. It's, it's not easy. We feel that, don't we, that yeah, being tough, hard parents. Thank you. So my husband and I are in ministry and we've... Um, Often, you know, we come across families where um, the children are in their teens and they're, you know, making mistakes and their parents don't want them to make mistakes because they love them, but the parents try and control their lives. Um, what's, and we've, we've tried a couple of ways of you know, trying to encourage them to let their children make mistakes um, because that's the only way they'll take responsibility. We haven't had much success <laughs> with, with that. Okay. What's a method uh, you've found 
um, to, success with. To teach other parents. Um, sometimes, I'm oh, sorry, I'll just move over here because that's ringing a bit. Um, sometimes the, the value is doing it in a little bit of a larger group, but very gently. Um, as a young pastor, again, if I kind of, I've always felt a bit torn because I'm this brand new pastor and I've got these little kids, what would I know about parenting, you know? And I was always reluctant to talk about parenting my kids had grown and gone, you know? Um, but I appreciate when we feel our role is to educate and train, then yeah, we feel it. So maybe expand the resource out a little bit wider and, and have some other, uh, put it in a safe place where you actually do a little parenting seminar kind of thing and, and open it, that might be one way. Um, and I think, yeah, just encourage, continue to, I think, to do it, just encourage them to, to, to recognise, maybe you can share, look, research suggests that, and I'm sure you're doing some, but have some research for them. So look, research suggests that the tighter, the more we're hovering, the more we're drone parents, to do, the higher the risk of the kids walking away. Uh, yeah. I, there's always going to be a certain reluctance of parents to feel as if they're being told what to do by somebody else. So we, we've got to develop an atmosphere of, sh of, of sharing and mutual sharing. So maybe sort of thinking around, how can I open this up a little broader uh, so that there are others of wisdom who can somehow in a safe environment open up some of this for reflection. I'd, I'd be tempted to try that. Yeah, thank you. Any That's others? Over here, yeah. Um. Do you have any special advice for parents of neurodiverse kids, like kids with ADHD or autism or different learning abilities? Yeah, thank you. No, I look, to be honest, I don't. It's not my specialty. I, I just bless you um, and encourage you to find strength for you, if, that's, if that is you, a, a parent. Um, parenting with, with children with um, child, et cetera, is a, is a huge journey, and I... My wife and I have often commented, we admire and honour parents who are full-time carers, um, but I just want to be honest, it's not my specialty, and uh, I encourage you to just sort of do some more research on that. Um, I, th I think it's that whole message of, sh of conveying love and, and empathy and, and, and warmth, but actual pre you know, specific skills, I, I would feel reluctant to just go down that road because I haven't had to do that and it's an area that I haven't really researched but I really appreciate your question. Is that okay? Sorry, I haven't been able to answer that. Thank you. You mentioned that you had 70, we have 75,000 choices of books. What would be <laughs> the top three that you would recommend for us as parents? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Have a look at emotion-focused parenting. Uh, would be one that I encourage you to have a look at. It's by John Gottman. He said he's the one who, and we didn't have time, but um, he talked about dismissive parenting. That, just give me one sec. I'll give you the... the um, yeah, the, he, he describes the dismissing parents and the effect on the children, disapproving parent, the laissez-faire parent, and then the emotion coach parenting. And he describes the incredible uh, differences that the emotion. So that would be one that I'd recommend. Um, have a look. I can't think of a particular title for you, but the, if you're looking in particular in the area of faith, um, Mark DeVries, D-E-V-R-I-E-S, or uh, Chap Clark um, would be worth having a look at. Um, they're just off the top, would be, would be some, as there's, have a think about what particular area would you like to look at and then focus in on there? But emotion focus there is just gold. Um, teaching our kids to, to work emotion, to respect and honor emotions is just huge, yeah. Thanks, guys. About done. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Blessings Jeff. to you all. Give him a clap. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Yeah. Grateful. See, you see um, retirement has some benefits. Yes. You can choose what you, you do. And I can say yes or no. us, so we are <laughs> grateful. Thank you. Look so forward to being with you, you tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Thank you to our PA team. Really appreciate it.